Hello and welcome to the second big debate on our brand new series coming to you live on SABC2 and SAFM. I'm Ridi Tlabi and thank you for joining us. Now in South Africa we already have a form of radical economic transformation. Every year billions of rands are being transferred from the poor to the rich. That's right. Companies such as banks and supermarkets are making record profits whilst millions of young people are unemployed. Now, the three richest men in the country have the same wealth as the bottom half of the population. Let that sink in. Most rural families can't even produce enough food to survive. So, in the run-up to elections, when politicians talk about getting radical, is it surprising that we are suspicious about their real intentions? What would real transformation in the interests of the poor look like? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Lindiwe Zulu, Minister of Small Business Development, Tsepo Mutsepe of Equal Education, Constance Mohale of the Alliance for Rural Democracy, Theo Diacher of the World Farmers Organization and South African Confederation of Agricultural Unions, and Ben Cousins, a land reform specialist. In our audience, we have business analysts Leon Lowe and Sid Venello, activists Sizani Ngubani, Vasco Mabunda, and Fatima Shabodin. Joan Fabs, the chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee on Trade and Industry. Temba Godi, who oversees our public accounts in Parliament. And economists Duma Kubule and Kanti Pai. We also have community leaders from across the country. Welcome to all of you. And of course, you at home can have your say. Contact us on Facebook or Twitter or give us a missed call and we will call you right back. We want to know what radical economic transformation means to you. Before we start our debate, take a look at this. Radical economic, social or whatever. Radical economic transformation. Uh, more radical transformation measures that are needed. Radical economic transformation. I started this radical transformation. You know, I started that thing. And I have seen that people have joined me. Yeah. Smell the coffee. Perhaps what the deputy president is saying is the coffee is not strong enough to be smelled. Every few years before elections, we are promised a better life for all or radical economic transformation now or never. With all the promises, you'd think we'd be living in a much different country. When David and Letta Beloy heard in 2007 that their land claim was successful, they thought radical economic transformation had come to the corner of Limpopo. But for seven years, they struggled to get the land transferred into their name. We spent about hundred and something thousand to challenge the government to get the title deed for this land. Now they are struggling to get their business off the ground. Their tomatoes are rotting, their cabbages are infested. <laughs> electricity, infrastructure, the road. There's no road to come in here. David and Letta's problems are not unique. Millions of rural families are unable to make a living, even with access to land. Once you do give people the land, what processes and procedures do you necessarily put in place to ensure that they get access to the tools of the trade, they get access to the inputs that they need in order to work the land and farm the land? There's then the other issue, which is, who am I then going to sell some of the stuff to? A handful of huge retailers dominate the food sector in South Africa. Together, their revenue is half a trillion rands and their profit is 20 billion. Their CEOs are some of the richest people in the country and they account for up to 97% of all formal food sales. And with the rising food prices in the supermarkets, 14 million South Africans struggle to feed themselves. Ironically, people who live close to food production live in hunger. Where's the radical economic transformation? Some free market economists think government needs to get out of the way to let markets operate more freely. So what people don't say is what you really want to do is take white land. Now, why would you want to do that? Because there might be a young 20-year-old white person who never lived under apartheid, never had anything to do with it, who bought a piece of land now, 
what account other than naked and crude racism would you want to take that person's land? By contrast, political economist Aya Bogatrawe says we need much stronger government intervention, especially to help small producers get their products to market. How do you regulate the distribution? How do you regulate the cold storage and the warehousing? How do you regulate the supermarket industry? Because in the absence of that, you are just setting up people to fail, you're setting people up to produce, but uh, to produce for waste because at the end, nobody will actually have uh, access to some of those products. Market dominance is not just a problem in the agricultural sector. It affects mining, manufacturing and finance too. South Africa continues to lag behind in terms of small business development, unfortunately. Uh, this emerged at the annual Small Enterprises Development Agency, CEDA, stakeholder. One of the reasons why we've got agencies that are supposed to assist us is because we want to see small and medium enterprises contributing towards the GDP. Despite these programs, township entrepreneurs have it very tough and at least half of township youth is unemployed. Given the slow progress, some rural activists are skeptical of radical economic transformation. We state capture. state capture. We see the beneficiaries of the radical economic transformation being the big elite uh, capital, one colluding with traditional leaders, colluding with politicians. Back on their plot in Limpopo, David and Leta Baloy are desperate. <laughs> Minister Zulu, let's start with you. There is no doubt that we need to lift people out of poverty and unemployment and we need urgent solutions. But is radical economic transformation as espoused by your president and some in your party a cover-up for something sinister? No. The big debate which we're talking about here, my view, is a good thing to be happening because we have to start the big debate on the economy of South Africa. How can we transform the economy of South Africa in such a way that the beneficiaries of that economy becomes the people that we are watching there on TV. So the debate is just started in as far as Why I'm concerned. Why is it starting now? You've had so many years since 1994. And we must take the point that was made in that insert that we're starting to hear a more amplified voices and an emphasis on radical economic transformation in the context of state capture. Are you not hiding something? Rightfully so. I don't think we're hiding anything because when we talk about radical economic transformation, we're talking about the ownership of the means of production in South Africa. You yourself and you were just reading about who owns the economy of South Africa. And the reason why we're talking about radical economic transformation, which by the way didn't start yesterday. For those who care, those who remember, the whole issue of black empowerment was brought through by this government. So radical economic transformation is about, you've done what you did in 23 years, you realize that what you've done in 23 years is not enough because it hasn't put you where you want to be. And therefore, your approach now needs to be radical. And therefore, the big debate must happen on the economy of South Africa. You need substance on that radicalism because otherwise it's just populism, it's just rhetoric, it's just there words. Is. And also it's important to refer to the outcome of your policy conference where as a party you reaffirmed your commitment to the National Development Plan and then a couple of days later your president was speaking RET. Where do you stand? Are you confused? There's no difference between uh, the National Development Plan and radical economic transformation. It is one thing. National plan for the next 30 years of what you're going to do to empower the communities who were shown there, not by just giving them land and not giving them the tools of trade and not building the infrastructure around them and not building the roads around them so that what you saw there with tomatoes drying up because there isn't enough water that the Minister of Water Affairs and all others have to work you together. You sound like an activist rather than the government minister who should have done something about what we've just seen, but we'll give you a chance to respond to that in just a moment. Constance, we need a little bit of radical economic transformation. Are you encouraged by what you've just heard from the minister? I, I think we need to move beyond debates to implementation.
25 years after people are losing patience because what we see from our point of view uh, I need to be convinced because what I see is that yes radical transformation has been happening but what is it happening for what is what we, uh, who is benefit who are the beneficiaries of radical transformation we don't see radical transformation benefiting the poor we see looting from the poor I've got few case studies of people uh, communities who are in debt once you become a landowner immediately you are in debt because you the 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 amendment of all the Water Management Act, the Mining and Petroleum Development Act, the, all these amendment bills are not done to empower people for radical transformation, but they are done to uh, make people's rights weaker. So we see people uh, getting desperate, poor, going to bed hungry. Every day. I want to bring you in here because you've been nodding. I imagine this is a scenario with which you are so familiar. Absolutely, Reddy. I think there are very few people in our country who disagree with the notion of radical economic transformation. We all know that this economy doesn't work for the majority of us. It works for those three white men. They've got an invested interest in keeping it as it is. The rest of us want to see something radically different. So the minister is right. This conversation didn't start yesterday. It comes from the Freedom Charter. Our Freedom Charter was very clear that the wealth of the country will, should belong to all of us who live in it. But the reality is dramatically at odds with that vision. And so for me, this conversation in this moment is about an extension of our liberation struggle. What was our vision and our dreams for ourselves? The majority of black women in particular are completely marginalized in this economy. And so for me, the starting point of that conceptualization, how do we give meaning to this concept, is to ask what would an economy look like that works for black women in South Africa, both rural and urban. And I know historically our focus has been rural women, but actually the majority of poor women act today live in South African cities. And so we've got to talk about urban poverty as well. So Theo, let me bring you in here. Willing buyer, willing seller hasn't worked. Is it time to give women such as these, the community members who are here, some land so that they can feed themselves, so that they can penetrate uh, that market? Does radical scare you? No, I, I agree that we need radical economic transformation simply because the biggest war of our generation is a war on poverty. And while people are hungry out there, no one in this country will sleep safe. So we, we need to kill the dragon of poverty, but there's only one way to do it, and that's through the creation of wealth. We speak as if wealth is a pool that is constant. It's being created every day or it gets into demise. What scares me is the idea that one should take away from one who has worked for something to give to somebody who might not be in a position to maintain it. Why would they not be in that position? Because they're not oh, getting the support because of our historical injustices of the past and others have the land, not because they work harder than other people, but because they lived in a system that enabled them, don't you think? In the case of the farmers, uh, the black farmers who got land through the land reform process, we have saw from the, the, the clip that they do not get ownership of the land. I want to see the best white farmers today to make a living without having the ownership of the land, without having access to financing, without having control over when they have the inputs and how they have it delivered, and then without having the access to the markets as they are struggling for it. It is only by producing something and selling it at a profit that you can really create wealth. Sizani, I want to bring you in here. I mean, you can't <coughs> give land to people who are not going to be productive. Is that the situation? Is that your experience? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Oh. Do we have the microphone? Yes. Go ahead, very quickly. Thank you, Susie. The, the situation is that when we are allocated land without any support, we would never be able to grow into big business or big commercial farmers. We're going to pick up on that note in just a moment. We're going to talk about the cost of food and how uh, food producers, emerging black farmers, are being kicked out of that system. We're going to expand this conversation in just a moment. Now, when we return, we ask, what will it mean to get radical? Is it time to dismantle large companies? If so, how? Send us your thoughts on social media or buzz us. You're watching The Big Debate. Welcome back to The Big Debate, live on SABC2.
CFM. Now, some people have argued that radical economic transformation is just a diversion for those in power who want to steal money. But what would real radical change actually look like? Would we have to take power away from big business to empower others? Can we do that without harming our economy. We'll continue with that discussion, but we have, as I said in the beginning, uh, members of the community, farmers who have joined us on the big debate today. Let's hear from some of them. Uh, baby, just talk to us. You've got a concerns about uh, chiefs and how they're benefiting from RET. Exactly. Um, we, we're having food security in our country, but the most unfortunate part is the households are not having food security in our country. And the the chieftaincy, which, are, which behaves like the gods of our lands, are actually depriving us our ancestral lands that the government is giving them 60% and we have to have 40%. I don't know what is it with them that they should, an individual own 60% of the land and the whole community whose great, great grandfathers bought the land for so much must only get 40%. And at the end of the day, we're having mines that are, that are, that are, that are being done in our, in our lands, and none of us are benefiting anything from those mines. None of us are benefiting anything from agriculture, okay. and no one says anything about it. We're going to get the minister to respond to that, but Tabian, you also have uh, an experience or a question that you want to ask very quickly. Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, the, this government, our current government, firstly, uh, thank you. It has to take a decision in terms of RET between the interests of the so-called royal houses and the community that has voted them into power. Secondly, uh, the communities are making uh, empty investments uh, ready. Mm. Uh, like the one Bakata has done to NEF. Bakata has put uh, 50, 50 million to NEF, which uh, I believe the minister, uh, as, as she said, uh, would make it fair uh, to Bakata to explain the beneficial part of that investment. And thirdly, uh, I have a concern uh, directly to that the Godi because it's Very been. Quickly, yep. Yeah. I, I've got a concern why you're not uh, referring the matter on state capture to SIU and the Hawks for proper investigation. Thank you. Minister, let's start with you because. <laughs> the question was directed at you government's proximity to the chiefs at the expense of the community. How do you defend your government? I think this government from 1995 have passed regulations and laws that guide that very relationship. Are they being implemented? Between, yes, they are being implemented. Then people are not saying so? Well, you have to give me a chance to reply. When you ask a question, I have to reply. I can say that it is not adequately being addressed. It's not being adequately addressed because it's not only just a government issue. It is an issue between the chiefs and the chieftaincies in the areas where they live and their communities where they live. I know as a matter of fact that government on its, pass, on its part, in terms of even speaking to the chiefs, we have the house of traditional leaders, by the way. And that house of traditional leaders, its role is not to entrench the chieftaincy for itself. It is about ensuring that first and foremost, the chieftaincy itself is being respected. Because you can't also say, no, we have nothing to do with chiefs. You cannot. We live in a country where chieftaincy is still being respected, respected by the very same communities. However, the laws that we pass are supposed to help us. And the, the, the constitution itself gives us the guide as to how the chiefs and their chieftaincy has to respond to I have to, to interrupt you here, Minister, because yes. we, are, we have very little time. But in a situation, he gave real examples about instances where the chiefs or the chieftaincies are not acting in the interests of the community, and it is the community that is voting for you. Are you afraid of losing favor with the chiefs? No, is it because never, of electoral we support? We can never be afraid of losing favor. This country depends on us communicating and engaging with each other. And when it comes to the Bahatla Bahafela, for instance, I know because even from a, my department's point of view, I've already been there physically to speak to Bahatla Bahafela to say, 
in your programs? What can we do to hold our hands and help you in helping the communities around you? But the issue of mining obviously doesn't fall in my department. It falls in the Ministry of Mines. But I know that the department also is engaging, not only with Bakhatla Bakhafela, because the land, as it was said, it must belong to the people and there must be a process that then assists us to do ben, that. Then let me bring you in here. I know that you spent years uh, researching land reform, Brazil, India. Are we on the right track? I mean, is land one of the key areas that would address or bring about this radical economic transformation? Are we going about it the right way? No, I don't think we are. The land reform pro program is failing miserably. Why? Uh, and government uh, is a big part of that. Firstly, the budget isn't big enough. Secondly, the policies are wrong. And thirdly, the cap state lacks capacity. So in fact, uh, government <coughs> is actually assisting a process of elite capture in land reform. And the question of the chiefs and mining is one example, uh, but it's not the only example. Uh, I would actually point also to the retail sector, the food sector. We've got a rather small number of companies which dominate the sector, and they crowd out small business. And in fact, local government is intent on providing more shopping malls with big retail as anchor tenants, and they crowd out small business. Small traders on the streets of towns and, ta uh, and townships are continually moved off the pavement. Small farmers which could supply those traders are not given space. Government is in fact aiding the big companies which dominate the economy. So both the private sector and the state are responsible for the mess that we have. So, my next question, Sid, I want to get your insights. Is it indeed time to break those established uh, 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 companies, supermarkets, the cost of food? We spoke about how 97% of food sales are going to the big four as it were. That's untenable. The farmers provide the supermarkets a bag of potato, two rand 90, and the supermarket are charging nine rand 50. That is diabolical. Well, it's diabolical when you, um, when you take those two numbers and you compare the one with the other, and you think that the supermarket has made a profit of seven rands a bunch, or whatever the, whatever the figure may be. But it, it doesn't work exactly like that. Um, the process of taking foodstuff from the producer from the farm ultimately to the shelf in the supermarket is a long process. The goods have got to be collected on the farms, they've got to be delivered by truck to a central distribution centre where produce, similar produce from let's call it a thousand farmers are brought into a distribution centre. The stuff has now got to be cross-docked. In other words, we've now got to work out, uh, ShopRite Group have got 1,100 and something supermarkets. This supermarket needs 50, that needs 100, that needs 500, that needs 200. It's got to be cross-docked. I accept that. So yeah. I have hold to interrupt. You. No, hold on, hold on. Hold on. But when you look at the profits of the supermarkets, billions, and when you look at the salaries of the chief executives, billions, surely they've gone beyond just covering their costs. The, the profit margin of a supermarket in this country, if you pick and pay, and I'm not saying pick and pay is the most efficient because they're the least efficient, but their profit margin is 2%. 2% on sales. You know, a lot of people argued when they, when they took Smart Shopper discount and cut it from 1% to 1.5%. In a way, they were forced into it because their profit margins are so low. But th that's, the, that's the extent of their profit margin. So. The, the difference between the two rands and the nine rands, that seven rand is ultimately whittled down, in the case of pick and pay, to 18 cents. There are a lot of costs in the distribution process. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that um, the supermarkets aren't making huge profits. They're making very huge profits. And of course, there's that whole matter that's uh, with the Competition Commission about how the fresh produce uh, producers, they are pushing up uh, their prices, kicking out the small man, and that leads to more emerging pro producers not being let in. Kanti, I do want to hear your perspective on this and how we can actually uh, broaden uh, that particular pie. We're going to come to you after the next uh, ad break. Uh, that's coming up in just a moment. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange recently hit record highs. So someone um, in, in South Africa is making a lot of money. There are people who are making a lot of money. So where have they stashed the cash? And can we get our hands on it for real radical economic transformation? We find out when we return.
Welcome back to the big debate on radical economic transformation coming to you live on SABC2 and SAFM. Now, South Africa is a wealthy country. Officially, we are upper middle income compared to the rest of the world. So we have enough to invest in good schools, good hospitals and good jobs. But that's far from the reality. So where's the cash? I have an economist in the audience. Kanti, where's the cash? Can we get our hands on it? Yeah, I think first, um, it has to be quite correct about what we mean by the economy. And uh, I hear a lot of people talk about owning the economy or um, benefiting from the economy, as if it's a thing out there, right? And I think that the government has facilitated that kind of debate where they say, we want our people to own the economy as if they themselves cannot be the economy. So, and our economy really is about who is actually doing something, right? Who's contributing on a daily basis? And I think in a big way, we've got to say, is every South African actually doing something, participating? And then we can talk about the economy because the people are the economy. And I think the exclusion means the economy is actually out in Sentin rather than actually people doing something in Soweto. And how do we make sure that that um, when we are discussing, for example, retail, that people are participating in exactly this value chain that has been described to us. People have access to trucks to be able to actually help those farmers to transport um, their water, food, water, farming, exactly, yeah. and all those things. And then you'd be able to say that those big retailers would actually be competing with people who are around them being able to do this. What has happened is that actually the economy has set um, in the defined way that it is, and everybody else is trying to actually get into it rather than actually participate and be it themselves. Well, let's talk about some people who are try to some people who are trying to participate in the economy, uh, informal traders, Nomsa and Rebecca. Let me start here with you. Tell me what you want to say. Hi, my name is Rebecca Chauke. I have a question here. My question says, why are we advertise why is the government advertising leadership while they already have their own people? They've already gave their families and friends. Hashtag nepotism must fall. <laughs> We'll give the minister, Nama Nomsa, what do you want to say? You are an informal trader as well, right? I am an informal trader. As informal traders, CI Funa, the radical economic transformation. We want, but we want to be involved in decision making. We want to be involved in, in, in rating standards of our produce and even uh, the currency. We want to, to make our, to, to create our product and our market. There must be nothing for us without us. Yes. Mama, see, we, we don't want... We don't want grants, handouts, and food parcels from you. What do you want? What do you want from the government? What do you want from the government? We, want, we, want, we just want land to just twist it there and do our thing. And it's not to Government, this is Ogusiza, Palms of Notwalis. That's how radically we want to change this and we want to transform this. Minister. <laughs> Minister, we, we, we spoke about uh, the land with Theo and many other people. We saw in our clip that people have the land, their produce is rotting, they can't access the market, no infrastructure, no water. How do you respond to these informal traders who want and need your support? Well, let me start by saying what we need to do is to, what we are planning to do and focusing on is strengthening the local government structures because it's one thing to be a minister of small business development right at the top where actually the real action needs to happen at local government. That is why in my department we have prioritized the connection between us at national and the delivery at provincial level because where Umama sits and does her... her, her her uh, informal selling, she can't see me every day. She can't see the department people every day, but she knows who the councillors are. She knows who are the people at local government who she needs to knock on their doors to say, I do, you do have a responsibility. Okay, give her a chance, give the minister a chance. Yeah, but yeah. Just well, finish that the, point, I need to interject. Yeah, quickly. I need to finish that point because you see, if we are not really going to be able to strengthen local government structures where where she needs to get the support first. And there's been a weakness in the system since 1994. We've strengthened provincial and local structures. We have not given enough time. We have not given enough resources. We have not given enough Why not? human resource. 
of people who in the offices at local government are the right people. I, I do want to ask you something because at local government, I remember a phase where informal traders were actually being swept away from the streets to clean the streets up, to make sure that the streets look good for 2010. They were not given the support that they need. I grew up in Soweto, that whole area around Orlando East and uh, Baraguana, there were informal traders and they were producing and they were selling, but local government did not support them. Ready, if you, if you can go back now, now and look at the 2010 of the place where you're talking about and look at it now there's a vast difference but we've got many other places in the country Maybe Maybe that there example, is a but big in, in difference the city as well in the city as well informal no, traders absolutely. are up against some odds and obstacles and red tape i i do agree we need to remove all those uh, obstacles we need to make sure that we do things also in an orderly way because the budget that we have is not the kind of budget that we would have wanted to have under normal circumstances. And therefore, we have to use what we have, slowly getting into everybody. It's impossible for us to have done everything within a period of but 23 years. But what is that years. you needed to do? Because an informal trader sets up there at the corner, uh, they're starting to sell, they can feed their children, they can what? clothe their children. Isn't the fact that you feel you had to do something another confirmation that you introduced a layer of bureaucracy that is unnecessary. Look at London, Nigeria, uh, 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 Nairobi, the streets of Nairobi and Lagos bustling with informal traders. Why don't we have, we have that? The corner dealership, why don't we have that? Ready, we would like to, to, to get to that point. It will take us time to We're get to that slowly. point. We're going there slowly. No, we're not going slowly. I think that in the South, Af <laughs> in the South African context, we also need to be realistic about our situation and be honest about our situation. That's why I'm saying this big debate that you're talking about, Ready, it is this very government that is saying, we got political power, we got it all, we held it on to it. The one thing that we didn't do very well is to work together, the political power and the economic power. Hence, we are now saying, let's be radical about how we ch make Constance, those changes. Constance, that must make you happy. The minister says we're walking together. We must walk together. You, mm. you satisfied? Yeah, indeed, the language, or the progressive language of activism has been hijacked because people, when you say radical transformation, I think it, 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 it started from the activism. It's like land agrarian reform. It's like all those progressive terminologies that are hijacked. But in practice, they are not happening. We're working together. But I mean, um, if you are not looking by your side, you'll, you'll find that you are working together, but people are working in front of you. Now, we need to rethink what we mean, we need to rethink the definitions of what we, we need to depart from one ground because we can't depart from one ground when the other is too rich and the other Tepo, one is I want too to bring poor. you in here, the voice of the young people. We have a high youth unemployment rate. We heard from Stats SA how more than half of South Africa's population goes to bed hungry. We also know that about only 56% of people who start school actually sit for their metric exam. They fall by the wayside. What would you like the minister and indeed established business to do? Well, I think really majority of our people find themselves, particularly black and poor people, find themselves in the middle of two burden some albatrosses. One, on the one hand, you have, you have government that seems to purport that they are powerless to really change the fortunes of our people. On the other hand, you've got beneficiaries of, 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 of apartheid who, who seem not to trust the government's intention in order to change the people who remain in the middle. And I think the crisis of, of, of education is a crisis of black poor people in the country who continue to drop out and you can clearly see the disjunction, Minister, between what you say and what the Minister of Basic Education says, that there seems to be a government that is not in sync with each other in terms of how they coordinate their, 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 their projects. On one hand, you know there's a crisis of youth unemployment. I think you know, the, the former statistician, General Balili Hotla, was correct to say if you want to fix the economy, you first need to fix the education system of the country. You cannot liberate young people in this country, particularly all nine million of them, out of poverty. When we return a challenge to the government, a proposal which might just help a thousand young people set up businesses, and we put your ideas to the panel. Don't go away.
Welcome back to the big debate. We are live on SABC2 and SAFM. Now, do we need radical economic transformation and how do we go about it? Let's hear more of your ideas. Before we do that, Temba Kodi, there was a question directed at you. And a lot of people do feel that there are enough resources to help people who need help. You sit on the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, we have heart attacks every time we hear how much money is being wasted. What are you doing about it? Well, I, I'm sure my African brother there will be pleased to know that uh, these days, whenever we have meetings as COPA, we have the hawks in the meeting. Even this coming Tuesday, uh, General Matakata will be appearing before us to give us progress report on the cases from Transnet that have been opened, as well as the cases that relates to the corruption in the South African police services. So we, we have sought to ensure that we don't only discuss what the AG has reported on, but that where criminality is involved, we ourselves refer to the police so that action can be taken. And I'm sure uh, people are aware that insofar as ESCOM is concerned, there is a process that is being undertaken. Um, insofar as uh, transport and even mining, there is also a process in parliament that is being, that is being taken. So I wouldn't say we are there yet, but at least for now, Parliament has risen up to the challenge. Joan Fabs, Competition Commission, you are in the committee that oversees DTI. Collusion is so ubiquitous. The Competition Commission is the one that looked at the fresh produce sector and actually found that black emerging producers are being kicked out and the established ones sell at a very low rate and when the emerging small producers run out of stock, the prices go up that again that again is creating this inequality that is the bane of our existence and then comes the competition commission with some minute fines that are just a fraction of the profits of these big companies what are you going to do about this well let me just make it clear that does not fall under trade and industry but under economic development thank you for nevertheless that we're not a silo. We don't work in silos. And trade and industry works very closely with economic development. Thank you. So we're quite aware that the fines are too low. Very often we start off in government with a much lower base. And it becomes apparent to us that this is petty cash, as happened with the bread issue. So now what we are looking at is reviewing these sanctions to make them far more realistic. And the issue around collusion, there's been a lot of talk about capturing of the state, etc. The reality is there's a capturing of society, not simply the state, but the private sector as well as the state. So when it comes to the competition, you essentially have a capturing of the private sector in that regard, so that the small person has to bear the price and pay for the criminality of private sector. How do we stop? <laughs> ben, how do we stop the greed in the private sector? I'm exasperated that food is so expensive and that proximity to land and agriculture still leads to people being poor because now food is about cost, it is about money. This is unacceptable. Uh, well, I think uh, the, the, there's several huge problems in our society. One is the 40% in real terms unemployment rate. The second is the lack of investment by the private sector in the economy. In fact, big companies across the South African sectors are looking to in invest elsewhere in Africa. One reason is because of low domestic demand. One reason why there's so low domestic demand is because 40% of people are unemployed and survive on social grants. So what's the root of this problem? In essence, it's the highly concentrated nature of our economy. That's very apparent in the food sector. Big food dominates the entire value chain. And in fact, in large-scale commercial <laughs> agriculture, only about 5 to 10% of large-scale farmers produce 90% of produce. This means that, as with land reform, we need a radical redistribution. We need to change that across the entire economy. But we also need the state to come to the party 
to enable investment in job creation. So, Minister, you're not doing enough uh, when it comes to this radical economic transformation. You're certainly talking about it, but you're not walking the talk. You're not doing enough to take on these big monopolies, these big companies that Ben has just told us about. Well, you've just been talking about the Competition Commission and what the Competition Commission has done. Who developed even the thought and making sure that we have something called Competition Commission? The Competition Commission is there particularly to help us. We've already made our own presentation, for instance, as a department to say, we see uh, your small and medium enterprises who are struggling in the value chain and not being able because the big companies have closed. We've also said, even the money that they're supposed to be paying, they turn around and even tell us how that money is supposed to be spent. What we have is a system that needs us to have this big debate about the economy. I, I really have a problem when we talk about the economy of the country and we look at little, we need a CODESA of some sort that will talk about the real economy because when we, when we started in, in South Africa to come into freeing South Africa, we had a CODESA. When I say a CODESA, I don't mean exactly the way it was in CODESA. What I'm saying, the country needs us to have a bigger debate about how do we change what we adopted in the very beginning. That is turning out that in 23 years, it's not working the Kandi, way we you want it to work. You shook your head quite work. vigorously there. You're saying no to the Cordesa, because we want to take the minister up on that. Where is the microphone closest to Kanti Pai? You were shaking your head, why? I think we don't need another big debate um, on the Cordesa of the economy when everybody's telling us what the problem is. We need to lean closer to the solutions about everything that everybody has said. Because the government keeps in saying, well, let's go for another process. Another process is not necessary because the people are telling us what they need. They saying we they want to be the economy. The government says, well, there's the economy. They are saying, bring it to us. Allow us what was in the Freedom Charter that said every single South African should have their capacity uh, developed. So what that what is being asked for is what people are saying. We need water mm -hmm. because that is going to help me develop my capacity. A discussion outside there about some Cordesa is not helpful at all. When we return, the last word from our panel. You're watching The Big Debate. Don't go away. Welcome back to The Big Debate. Don't forget, when this show ends on TV and radio, the discussion continues on Facebook and YouTube. It's never long enough. We'll ask the minister how you can apply for small business support. So stay with us online. But first, let's hear what our panel have taken away from today's discussion and what are the challenges. Fatima, let me start with you. Uh, we've heard the cries of informal traders. We've heard community leaders. What do we need to do? Really, despite the political rhetoric, we don't see government acting in the interest of our people. If I leave here tonight and I steal the bread, I will be locked up, I will be in prison tonight. We have a bread cartel who 10 years ago, literally stealing breads out of the mouths of children in our country. And did the prices of bread come down after the pandemic? And the milk as well, let's not forget that. We've had, so we need to give this competition commission some teeth so that we can start closing down businesses who, who rob poor people. And we need to see our government intervening in that market. It cannot be a neutral regulator. We want to see government coming out much more harshly, hardly in favor of poor people in our country. We don't see enough of that. Theo, your comments? The core of our problem is in the deep rural areas. The, the, the people are on the poorest, and there we have the biggest crisis with household food security. Now, there is no sector of our economy which can create more wealth in the shorter space of time and cheaper and create more jobs in those areas than agriculture. Mm -hmm. But then we need to create a policy environment which is co conducive to the profitability of new entrants into the agricultural markets. And we need much better agricultural training in our country. We need to, be to, to keep up with the latest technology. Mm -hmm. And we need to teach farmers the business side of farming. My colleagues here from Limpopo who are complaining about their farms. They can farm. They know cattle. They know maize. It is the business part of it. Procuring 
accessing finance and then link their produce to the markets. That is what killing their businesses and which keeps them poor. Are you concerned about uh, what we've heard today about uh, how some established uh, players are keeping the smaller emerging ones out? Because that's a serious concern as well. Oh, yes, as long as we cannot solve that, mm. no one will be safe in rural South Africa. Sebo? I think really for radical economic transformation to happen, you need three conditions to be met. One, you need a, a state that is not corrupt, government officials that work to wake up every morning to say we want to serve our people. <laughs> and I think, secondly, secondly, as Tlanti, as Tlanti puts it, you need to be able to say, how do you make sure that the people see the economy within themselves? You cannot have a government that invests in big malls and, and expect that you're going to have our mama being able to, to empower themselves and take their children to school. It cannot happen. Instead, you're assisting, you assisting the likes of ShopRite checkers to continue to pay young people in this country 10 rand an hour while the CEO lives with quadruple amounts of, 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 of bonuses. Consent? Last word for me. Really, from where I'm coming from, radical transformation has to start with the redistribution of land. And when we, we say land, we don't mean only the soil. We mean land and the natural resources like water. You know, the, 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 the people who have been owning land for a long time, they have their water rights. We don't have the water rights because they have amended the, the, the Water Management Act in 1998 to take that water rights from us. Now, we need the redistribution of land and we need, uh, we need the imbalances of power. Eighty-seven percent of land has to be redistributed among All the right, residents. We, we get of that South point. We'll expand on it in the second hour. Final thought, then, very quickly. One thought. The top twenty percent of farmers produce eighty percent of the value. That means we can redistribute eighty percent of the land to small-scale black farmers without endangering food security in our country. Minister. Um, I believe that uh, as government, we need to learn the lessons of the past twenty-three years sharpen our plans for the next 30 years and we do have a plan in the plan of the national development plan and we have seen that the national development plan is working but it's not working at its fullest and, and i agree that we have to have a, a people who are behind the desk who know that what they are there for is for assisting the people not for themselves the very government itself it's about us in government also knowing that we are there for the people now we cannot really think that Overall, everybody's going to do the right thing at the right time. What is important is what does government do to catch those people who are not doing the right thing by government? We have to and leave it at that. People. We have to leave it at that. And Minister, we must thank you for coming on to the big debate and engaging and deepening the dialogue with us. Not many people do, so we appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, is radical economic transformation coming, or do you still believe it's a cover up? You decide. Thank you for watching the big debate. This is the last episode for 2017. You can catch the repeats Saturdays at 11 p.m. in the lead up to Christmas. We'll be back with brand new big debates in February. Stay tuned on YouTube and Facebook now for another hour of this conversation. Goodbye. So, Minister, I am going to let you continue and complete that thought because I know you're going to be uh, leaving us soon. I think that it's important that you speak because practically every single complaint is directed at the government. A sense that the government is not using its resources optimally, that where the state intervenes, it's not doing so efficiently. And what we heard from Constance and the informal traders, it, it, there's a sense that the debate has already happened. Now we need to do. We are doing. That's one thing for sure. You I sit here, I sit here as a Minister of Small Business Development. It's three years that I've been in office. I'm very excited because the very same uh, mama who was talking about the informal business, we do have a plan which we have put together. We call it the informal upliftment strategy, which is supposed to assist us. And we are saying we need to connect national, provincial, and local to implement that strategy. And that strategy, I have, in the three years that I've been in office, I've covered all provinces, but not everyone in each and every province. We've given finances.
to some of the informal businesses. We've given finances to women. 50% of what we've given has gone to women. We've given out implements of trade. We've gone to markets and given women who have uh, 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 hair salons, we've given them the implements, we've given refrigerators, we've asked the people, what is it that you want? We didn't give what we think they want. We gave them what they asked for. But my last point is, the economy of South Africa needs to be brought by all of us together. It cannot be a situation of bashing left, right, and center. We all need to take responsibility because my view is this, and my experience in small business, I'm saying where I go, let people in the area where they are understand the economy where they are so that they can be able to take advantage of that. Now, when you have people who sell the wrong thing at the wrong place, it's not going to work. It's our responsibility as government through education to make sure that our people are empowered to run their businesses. And this department is here particularly for that. Do you have an idea of how many SMMEs are there and how many you've supported over the years and which sectors in particular? We've support, well, I wouldn't put the figure exact because there's still an argument about that sector because I we still need so. to, okay. there's still an argument about it. And again, figures must not be counted by me Figures must be counted by States SA, and States SA is doing that very well for us. Uh, let's just hear from uh, farmers in Limpopo. You are from Limpopo, Sam, and you are experiencing these hardships that we've just described. Do you want to talk to us? <coughs> uh, put the microphone on. My name is Samuel Kabe. We are a farmer at home. So, now I have a problem with my wife and my wife. I come back to the world. We have so many people who are not able to get their money back. We have done quite a few employers. We have 18. We have done different things. We have done plus minus 30 casuals. We have done quite a few things. We have done some things. I come back to the world. We have done quite a few things. We have done some 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 things. You're employing 18 people, 30 casuals, you're battling with water and gas. I wonder if I've done a decent translation, but Vasco, uh, you can add some more. Yeah, no, that's a very uh, decent uh, tra translation. Uh, I think all he's asking for is, gov is for a government to actually, or rather, um, yeah, government to actually assist him because if they don't, then uh, obviously in time it's not sustainable as it is right now. Mm -hmm. He's a farmer. Okay, Flora, I also want you to share your experiences as well. You can share that mic. You're also a farmer, right? Yeah. Mm. I'm a flora balo. I work on my mavungen. Mavungen is a climate farm. A lot lemma. But the na chicken farm is forty thousand. Maraswes I like existing because government I like ungeni lele ni hello. Ye pari le swe swe. No bla bla hoti right. Oh, kole tin tongo. Oko oka ya kaya kunale swenga temba so. So I like funi. Vasco, if you can translate for us, please. Okay, Vasco is still double checking okay, no, something. All right. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, what he's saying is uh, they have, uh, I mean, through um, government land reform program, they have been able to secure a large tract of land. But that is, uh, it has come to zero because they are not able to use the land productively due to lack of support from government. So, as it stands, the only thing that they are doing is to uh, they are doing pigari on very small scale basis, so they are not able to feed their families. That's, as that's what you spoke about earlier. I mean, the willingness is there. People love their land. They love to farm. They love to work the soil. But these problems you've seen. And, and to do more of that kind of um, transfer of land is not going to bring us anywhere. We must get that land productive and we must get her profitable. And for that, we need uh, capital available long-term lo loans at softer than what is available in the market this worked for the whole of latin america it worked for the whole of asia it works in ethiopia and in swaziland and in, in zambia there's no reason why we cannot have it here too in the old days we had the, the agricultural credit board a special purpose vehicle to assist new entrants into the, the, the industry, such as flora. Leon, I, I, mean, um, <laughs> I want to go to Leon. Leon, no, we haven't heard from you, especially thoughts around uh, free market. We've heard so many criticisms and challenges directed at the minister, but equally, 
at big business, particularly for closing the market to black emerging producers and farmers. As the Free Market Foundation, um, where, where do you stand on this? Uh, surely we need some sort of regulation to make sure that uh, more vulnerable people are protected. Well, actually what we have to do is get rid of the regulations and I just want to mention the street traders we heard about. Uh, they were cleaned off the streets of Johannesburg by the cleansing department in an operation called Operation Clean Sweep. 6,000 informal people, unwed mothers with children they couldn't feed, driven off the streets by the privatized police force, the Red Ants. It was completely despicable and disgusting. At whose instruction? At the city council's instruction. We were instrumental to bringing the case to the constitutional court that ordered the council to let them back on the streets. This is happening all over the country. Our next in the Free Market Foundation constitutional case is going to be in the informal settlement. The minister said we need to do things in an orderly way. No, you need to in an orderly way stop harming people instantly. There's no excuse. Uh, so, but just let me mention something else. The, one of the biggest and poorest and most uh, uh, awful uh, informal settlements in South Africa, Marathon in, in uh, Germiston with about 70,000 people, I would like to take people there and show them. Now, what is happening there is the people living there who, with whom we work, they just want to be left alone. They say, let us improve our own houses. We're not allowed to. We are forced to live in tin shacks. We want to do our own paving. We have plumbers, we have small businesses that can do everything. And the laws, the town planning laws, and the licensing laws, and the building laws, and the safety and health laws, are what are oppressing them. And they know that very well. So what you have to do is stop holding people down. And that is not being done by big business. That is being done by the government daily throughout South Africa. So Ben, what do you say? The government must just stay out of it and uh, let people do it themselves? What's the big success story in poverty reduction in the world today? It's the Chinese economy. What's different about the Chinese economy? The massive role played by the state. State-owned companies, state finance, state direction. Actually, we need to think about going in the socialist direction, in my view. Uh, with respect to... With respect to agriculture, I'm absolutely in agreement we need to support informal traders and small-scale farmers who already supply large amounts of fresh produce and livestock to people. They need support and they need help. But we also need to uh, agree uh, that the large-scale commercial farming sector is not creating employment. In fact, it's losing jobs and it has been doing so for a long time. Actually, small-scale agriculture, which is labor-intensive and creates jobs, would be much more uh, efficient and appropriate for our country than large-scale agriculture. So I think you know, that's, that could be a model for how we think about the economy as a whole. The large companies are actually often monopolies or near monopolies which are earning monopoly rents. Take the cell phone companies, which are milking us all dry. How, why, why have we only got three or four cell phone companies? Why didn't we open this up to competition? We need the, a much clearer role for the state to intervene on the side of small people rather than the elite. So, so Minister, I mean, we don't doubt your good intentions, but to be fair, in the last uh, over two decades, the ANC has been very close to this, these big businesses uh, that Ben Cousins has just spoken about. I'm really not, I don't think the ANC has been close to big business. I, I wouldn't say so. I think what has happened is that in the regulations and the laws that we have passed, we have not ensured that there is implementation thereof. This is, what, this is the biggest problem in South Africa. We've got good policies, good laws, good everything. Not the challenge the, is, not the, the challenge is... Not in land reform, you say, Ben? They're absolutely the challenge, the challenge is in the implementation because if... The challenge is in the implementation. Because if you talk about land that has already been given back to people, and the complaint is, you've given us the land, but you have not given us enough tools, we have not given us enough infrastructure for that. That's what we need to focus on. We have not so been that able... shows weakness in the policy then, in the strategy, because yeah, yeah. you stopped at giving land and you didn't think about the future, you didn't think about what it requires. That's a poor policy. And, and I'm not saying that, no, it's not a poor policy. It's an inadequate policy. There's a Semantics. difference. No. <laughs> it's, it's, 
it's not it's not sem se no it's not semantics and and quite frankly i believe that if we want to get to the next level of where we want to go to communities have the right to be harsh to be strong to demand government has got the responsibility to listen to those communities and change what hasn't worked since we started in 20 in 19 in, in 1994 but also to get a blanket picture that says this country hasn't done anything this government hasn't done anything we are nowhere from where we were from 1994 to today I don't think that's I don't think true. anybody's saying that. Nobody yeah. has said that, uh, that the government has not done anything. But what people are saying is that with the expertise and the resources that we have, the grassroots activists are seeing that the government is not doing enough. But we'll get to that in just a moment. You want to make a comment? We want to hear from Dumat Gubule in, in a moment. We'll go to the back there. And also some community members. Tamsanga, I, I see you. You want to talk about the Zamazamas and how they can be brought into the formal economy. We'll come to you in a moment. So I'm Janet Landy from the International Special Events Society and I work with the, with the CETA, with the Services CETA. And basically one of the conversations missing is shared value. This value, the, the missing link is that mentorship, those shared resources, those shared um, moments, that social cohesion and social co uh, inclusion. We absolutely need to ensure that you can't just have land or property or anything unless there's somebody who's there going to help you along the way. We need shared value in this country, shared resources, shared spaces. Duma, we haven't heard from you, your analysis of so, RET um, and where we are. I just want to say that um, listening to the minister, um, I just want to weep. Um, the, you the just want to weep? I want to weep, yeah, because this country, the reality is the ANC government has mismanaged our economy for 23 years. And especially in the last, uh, since 2009, the global financial crisis. Um, our unemployment has gone up by, to 9 million people by 3 million people. There is not a plan by any of the ANC government departments to arrest the decline, in un, to, to achieve a decline in unemployment, poverty, and inequality. None of the presidential candidates have offered a plan, a vision, and minister, the NDP is not a vision. It's not a plan. But, yeah. well, it has, it, it has is not a plan. plan. And then secondly, we are in the worst post-apartheid crisis. You cannot say your policies are right. It's not true. Yeah. So what do we need? We need to, okay, really, I'm just saying that we have to change radical economic transformation. The president on Monday, he announced a policy that's going to, austerity policies of 80 billion rands to cut the deficit. But after he'd said, after the medium yeah, term... Yeah, guess what? No, after the midterm yeah. budget, he said that there's no economy that's in crisis. It's been growing under the ANC. So now he's no, tasked no, the, the minister to help the economy. That's economy what he economy said. per capita terms of the last three years has been declining in per capita terms. And they, what depresses me is that if you read the ANC's policy documents out of the conference, there is zero that explains how we're going to get out of this crisis. And if you talk about what they're going to discuss at the conference, zero about how to get out of this crisis. I'm sorry. All right, let me take that microphone. A gentleman at the back there has had his hand up for quite a while. We'll get comments from the minister. Instead, I want to, you to come uh, in in just a moment. Yes? I even missed the live show. <laughs> um, the basic tool for, to address the socioeconomic problems is the land. The UN East 28 friends has the land. They are not sharing the land. Why are they not sharing the land with black people? Why are they not sharing the land with us? Theo, are you not sharing the land? No. Let's give him a chance to respond. A question has been asked. I have a serious question about this notion that if you have land, you will have wealth. You cannot eat land. It's what you do on the land that makes you eat. It is not simply about a redistribution of land. But it's a start? It's a start? Is yes. it a start? First of all, we, we must get... Let's listen to the... Uh, we yeah. must get especially young people who have the aspiration to farm on a commercial basis, to make profit to, to, uh, from the land. And then we must empower them to run a business on there with government assistance. All over the world we have extension services assisting new entrants, which in South Africa is very, very poor. <laughs> and, and it does not mean that the land needs to belong to the state 
I, I do not concur with Ben's notion of having it in the social system. We must create young black entrepreneurs. If we do not have in 10 years from now a class of profitable black farmers, food security is done in this country. Sid? Carry on, please. Um, You've got the mic. Yes. Um, Theo, Theo made, a very, uh, made some very good points earlier. Um, I think I'd like to come to the... Um, to the uh, to the point of the government. In fact, what I'm what I'm trying to say is, I think the government has done some very good things, particularly the issue of um, um, the, uh, the, the the land redistribution process, and you know, with um, um, with fo with people being able to get their land back, you know, through the uh, through that whole process. But unfortunately, it seems to me as if we've got a circle, and we've only gone halfway. And we haven't finished off the circle. We haven't, we, we haven't kind of touched, uh, put all the pieces together. For instance, let us assume our, um, our farmers over there, the, the one in the clip, who said she had a farm, or it was he or she who had a farm, but they couldn't do anything with the farm. Um, no be, because they didn't have access, they didn't yeah. have access to, uh, they didn't have access to water, they didn't have access, presumably, to uh, um, to seed <laughs> or fertilizer and what have you. Well, why, if that land was transferred into their name, which was the original intention in, in the first place, then the owner of that land could approach the, um, the land bank or some other agricultural board, obtain a loan on the strength of that land, use that, use that loan to acquire the seed, to acquire the fertilizer, and actually get a profitable farming enterprise going. Am I right, Theo? Okay. So, so let's hear from the farmers. I mean, let, let's... Okay, so many hands have gone up. You want to respond to this? The land back in particular. Who wants to respond to this particular point? I, I, we have some farmers in the audience. Is it easy to get to the land back and, uh, land bank and ask for a loan? Is that... Uh, it sounds like a walk in the park, the way Sid has described it, is it? Uh, I thank you. Um, Vasco, can you address this issue? You can go to the land bank, get, get uh, a loan, uh, get the infrastructure that you need, and uh, access to market will follow. Uh, land reform beneficiaries and small-scale farmers will tell you that uh, the land bank is a white elephant. The land bank has only, the only thing that has done successfully is creating scandal after scandal, you know. In fact, it has been, uh, it, it has been, uh, what it has been doing was to facilitate um, the elite uh, capture of the land reform process. So uh, it is not as easy as that. But if you will allow me, I will actually, I will, I will actually want to get into this RIT thing. If you give me a minute. Sure, go, go for it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I work for a land rights support organization that worked uh, with uh, rural dwellers, farm dwellers, and I mean, small scale farmers and restriction claimants. Our experience is that, um, or our understanding of uh, uh, radical economic transformation. Uh, is that, I mean, we understand, we understand it within the context of uh, redressing uh, apartheid and colonial um, injustice, particularly um, in regard to, to land. What we're seeing today, the 40% unemployment, this thing of about every, I mean, uh, uh, people going to cities to join the ranks of unemployed people is a result of that legacy of uh, uh, apartheid and colonial land disposition. If you are ever going to reverse that, first, you will actually have to reverse the racially skewed pattern of ownership. As it stands now, I think the minister thinks government has given people land. No, minister, it's not true. In fact, of the 30% um, target what, that was supposed to have been met uh, by 2008, only about 5% uh, has been redistributed. Uh, the 14, in the, after when they failed to meet it in 2014, uh, it was now set for 30% in 2014. It hasn't happened. If you read the, 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 the report, the Mutante panel, uh, the high-level uh, panel report, it will tell you that just over 5% of the land has been redistributed. And then in regard to restitution, very thin, not, uh, close to, uh, almost close to nothing has happened. In fact, there's been a lot of fraud in there. Because now we, when you pay people uh, a compensation, which is uh, not even uh, valued, I mean, which doesn't even have a relationship to the, to the value of their land, 
you actually uh, construe it as hectares. So as it stands, the majority of people who have actually lodged a land claim decision have been given financial compensation, money which I can drink over the weekend, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just enough. Yeah. So uh, lastly... Okay, Vasco, we've got to give other people a okay, chance. Uh, lastly, last you, point. Okay. Last yeah, last point. Uh, if you're ever going to address the question of unemployment, you're going to have to build a rural economy. You are going to have to stop people after the matriculants pass metric, they don't have to go to Joburg. You are going to build another countryside like white people did with Makuba Street and other countries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I just want to ask the, the minister on the question of land because the EFF was willing to give them the 6% so that they can have the required majority to amend the constitution. Why did they refuse to accept the 6%? <laughs> You got the question, Minister. We're going back to, uh, to Parliament. Well, maybe answer that one first because it is the easiest of the lot. And on Vasco's uh, issues, I do want to add something else. Uh, but maybe have the, have the mic. Uh, go ahead. Well, with regard to the 6% which the EFF was willing uh, to help, it's easier said than it is done because get, giving back the land, I still go back to this. And I agree with you. The one, I agree with you. I didn't say the government has given all the land that it's supposed to give. I've said where government has given back the land, the weakness has been the maintenance of that, the implements for that land, and the people working, having enough education to even understand that they're doing, they product, they're producing there, and understanding the entire value chain. How do you get there? Because it's painful to see those tomatoes that are, mm. are, 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 are rotting. rotting there. But you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say the reason the tomatoes are rotting are this and that. I'm being narrow in my approach. It's important for me to go there and ask, why are the tomatoes like that? What is short in order for us to be able to fix it? So the 6%, the, the obviously, we couldn't take the 6% of the, of the EFF I because challenge you on that. remember I said earlier on also, and I still repeat it, anything that we do has to be done orderly re and, uh, and, reading. And, and really everything that we do, we must do it also considering that we are a law-abiding country, we have a constitution, you can't just wake up in the morning and say, me, I'm going to do anything I want, because then you're going to have chaos. Minister, I think most reasonable people agree with that. Mm. And it is comforting to know that the government wants to do things according to the law. But the problem is, when it suits some in the ANC, the, hold on, they start saying things that they know they don't mean and they cannot do. They're grabbing land without compensation. One of your colleagues, Ayanda Lolo, said it. The president himself said it in parliament. So why say something to the population that is restless that you know you cannot implement? I don't understand. No, but really, I don't understand. I, I didn't understand you when you're saying... They, they, they said about grab the land without compensation. No, no, no. I, I, he, 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 his question was, the EFF was willing to give you 6% to amend the law. Mm -hmm. Your answer, which sounds very measured and reasonable, was that it's not that easy. You've got to go uh, according to the constitution. You can't just wake up and do certain things. So I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying why say those things when you know you can't do them? All you're doing is that you're sowing discontent amongst the population. It's the president himself who said that we're going to change the law uh, to get land without uh, compensation. So now you're telling us it just can't be done. No, I'm not saying it can't be done. Can I please be understood? No. It can't just no. be done. Just no. is the operative word. I'm saying, I'm saying it can't be done without following due process and procedure. It, it cannot be done. You cannot be unruly in a way that you want to fix your country. You, you cannot. If we need to pass the law, really, if we need to pass the law, we've got to go back to Parliament, We've got to go back to our, our constituencies. We've got to do things the right way. It's, it's a painful thing to say, but that's the fact because we, need, we are a law-abiding country and we need to stick to that. So let's just, the law is failing. What are you saying? I mean, for instance, 1994, uh, South Africans have been law-abiding citizens. We did not fight after apartheid was dismantled because we were told to come down, be a peaceful nation, and deal with uh, things in an orderly fashion. Even with the economy, we have uh, concepts, documents that we have incepted. We go to the DTI, the NYTA, and so forth. When you get there to establish a, into a, a relationship with them to say, we need funding, they will tell you, in order for us to fund your initiative, you must get a white-owned uh, anchor tenant like pick and pay and check us and so forth. So basically, 
our, 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 country, our country is not our own. We are treated as the visitors in our country, and the visitors in our country are having a jolly good life, while we as South Africans, especially young people, excuse me, especially as young people, we are suffering. We're trying to establish businesses, but our businesses are being failed by the government and other private sectors. We're trying to make a living on the streets, but we're also being handled by the police. So, Mina Minister, my, my request, actually my challenge to the Department of Small Business Enterprise is that take me today. I have a business plan, I have a business concept, I have financials, I have everything. Take me today and, 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 and show us and show us what radical economic transformation is because I have been struggling for 10 years to get funding and I've been told I'm talking hot air. Okay. Let me, Minister, let me give you a chance to just breathe. We'll come to you in a moment. Let's get a few more questions. We have to, okay, one more question. The minister has to go. The minister has um, to go. What, okay, hold on. We're running out of time. Ask your question, okay, please. Um, quickly, uh, one question to the minister and to Mr. Theo. Okay, uh, minister, so far everyone has spoken about other things that affect the economy and, and, and the radical economic transformation. But I think that another big elephant in the room is external forces like your rating agencies, the minute the government speaks of anything that is progressive, we are threatened that we're going to be junk status. How is the government going to implement these uh, uh, progressive uh, policies, but also try to avoid the external forces that are forever putting pressure on South Africa? One and question one each. We don't have time. Sorry. Okay, okay. I'll okay, so, quickly. So quickly to Mr. Theo. Um, you, you, you are right that the government giving land back to uh, black uh, farmers w without supporting is, is not going to work. But we just also established that willing buying, uh, buying seller deal is not working. That means white owners are also not willing to sell. He's right to say there is an element of resistance coming from your side. Okay. Maybe let's give Theo a chance to respond to that and then Minister, I'll come to you because most of the questions were directed at you and we didn't answer Vasco's question as well. Theo? I do not agree that the willing seller principle did not succeed. It was a competent buyer that was missing. Where government paid too much for land it is not because the seller controlled the transaction. The buyer controlled the transaction. There is no alternative for willing buyer, willing seller, because if we erode the market, if the market collapses, it will not only collapse on land. We have seen that in Zimbabwe. And I also want to challenge my young friend here, referring to me as a visitor, as a white Afrikaner man, I am as much as a South African as anyone in this room. I am a 12th generation South African. I have no other home than South Africa. And that's why I am as committed as any one of you to make it work here. But we must, in the first place, give the minister credit for standing on the point that we need an orderly process. We cannot go any other way than an orderly way. Well, I think what was the happening in Parliament was a constitutional amendment. You can't crime. be as orderly we as that. We cannot afford. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Ms. Nisa, there's so many things that we asked of you, but Vasco's question around support for farmers, around people who received money instead of land and uh, didn't get the support and the despair that comes to that. I do want to draw to our history. During apartheid, uh, the, the National Party government supported white farmers. That was the policy. We know that. That is the history. And we also know that during the years of isolation, it was particularly crucial for the government to support the farmers so that this economy survived survive during the, 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 the uh, isolation. Why are you not learning from what the Nets did and support people yeah. like, like Vasco with the same vigor and energy? Well, it, it is unfortunate that obviously we're sitting with uh, people who have not benefited in as much as they have to benefit. But it is also fortunate that there are other thousands of our own people who've really taken advantage of whatever government has assisted them with from the land to implements of the land, including the ones who, where the money was paid to them uh, 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 for the land, even though my brother says, yeah, it's money that you can go and, and, and drink. Which is, but, 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 it, but it is also very unfortunate because quite frankly, even that kind of an attitude for us in South Africa, it is not correct. If we can go and look at how much money government has spent 
on issues of land, on, Give the minister on, issues, on issues of land, how much money has been spent, in, even including the grants that we are talking about. Because the grants are meant to uplift our people, those who cannot. The grants are meant to assist families. Well, 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 look, maybe because I grew up very differently, so the grants meant a lot, meant, means a lot for my people where they are. I sit here in Johannesburg, and my people who are in KZN, when they have to go and collect those grants, they had absolutely nothing else. But the, some of them have taken, they've taken that money of the grants. We're working with them to create cooperatives and small businesses and everything that they can. We don't want grants, for God's sake, in the South Africa. However, if we look at where we are, where we were, and the grandparents who have no pensions, no money, no nothing, most of that money is the money that puts the food on the table for those people. So we need to move away. We need to move away from that by saying, you've got a Department of Small Business Development. Work with social, work with social development. Just yesterday, for your information, I was in Mamelodi. I have it here in my pictures. I went to a cooperative of women who were supported by the Department of, Small, of, of Social Development with sewing machines. Those women are producing uniforms for the schools in the area. So, and that's not just one, there's others. In the Eastern Cape, I've been to those cooperatives who have been supported by government. Yes, I fully agree. We haven't done as much as we're supposed to do. 23 years in office, so it might be long for others, it's short for others, but we do have a plan. And, and, and for Dumsani, obviously, to me he left because he wants to whip. He says the, 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 the national <laughs> development plan, the national development plan, which is a plan, by the way, that was adopted not only by government, it was adopted by our own communities because we consulted on what needs to go into it. it yeah. Well, well, you can say so. It was, and by the way, and by the way, that is also a plan that was discussed even with big business, discussed even by political parties. There in parliament, it was political parties who said, we agree with this Your plan. Your president never mentions it, though, in his speeches. I that's true. Know. What do you I want to say, Ben? Fair. What do you want to say, Ben? I don't think that's the fair. There's two things we can do here. We Arity. can either bash Minister. each other or... I'm mentioning a fact. Forward, Nobody's bashing anybody. Nobody's bashing. It's a fact. Minister, it is important to consult the people. <laughs> Land reform policies are going very badly wrong. How do we know? The high-level panel of parliament, chaired by the former president, Motlandi, went out to many provinces. They had many meetings where ordinary people came and presented their analysis. Those are now summed up in the final report, and it's a complete and damning indictment of all government policies with respect to land reform. If we listen to the people, we will get proper policy direction. The and we haven't done this with land reform. That's, that's why we have that report. We start reading. That's why we have that report. We, 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 that's why we have that report. It is the very same government that said some of the legislation we have is not working very well. Let's put that panel together so that we can go back is to the people. Is it being acted on? That was the question. It just came out. Okay. It just then came you out. Accept that, right? It just came it just out. Came out. We're, we're we are going to, to act it's on it. It's festive season. See. Next year, we're we'll going to. No, <laughs> we're going to act on it. <laughs> All right, we've got a young person here. The yeah. minister is to go. We're going to hear from young people. Um, I hear Minister Zulu talking about um, doing things right. Whereas the government is doing everything wrong. Why is our community like this? To, why is our economy like this today, whereas you are doing the right thing? We know that you can't help everyone, but then at least do something. Instead of coming here and telling us that you have done something, and like, I, I don't believe what you're saying. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You are where, where do you come from? Who are you? Where do you come from? Uh, I come from Deep Sloot. You and come from Deep Sloot? Yes. My community is, is a very struggling community, especially, and poverty is our main problem in our community. Yeah. And I've never seen you in our community. And yet, whereas you talk about Eastern Cape, you talk about Soweto, you talk about all those places that you've been to, where have you 
Have you ever come to Deep Sloot and witnessed what we are facing in uh -huh. Deep Sloot? What are you facing? We are facing issues like... What are you facing? Hold as, on. As he has said, that he, he has had a business plan for almost 10 years and nothing has been done for him. Okay. Whereas you are the minister of small business and I also have a business plan as a young person like this. And Okay. All right. I, I just want to ask you, you're wearing a blue t-shirt. You're not the DA. No, I'm not the DA. Well, I'm wearing red. I'm wearing red. No, just Hey, hey, quickly, go, go. quickly. The minister has to go. <laughs> quickly. Thank you. Um, I want to say two things, only to the minister and Theo. Here, I want to start with you. Really, you are saying that you have 200 and something companies. I would really want to know how many are black people who are the owners of these companies that you are talking about. And let me tell you something that you are not aware of, because I'm currently having a house and I bought the land for 230. So the land is very expensive, my brother. So give it to us, share with it, us, we'll make money with it. Minister, to come to you. I'm coming from the Eastern Cape. Let me tell you the problem is that we have to leave the country, the, the, our province, and the places that we are living, we are living from, and come to 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 to, to, to come and and, and, and work in Gauteng. We really want to go back and work in the Eastern Cape. Yeah. But the problem is that in this South Africa, and I'm worried that the Minister of Higher Education is really not here. Because the problem is that we are really educated to become employees. We want to be employers. <laughs> Okay, so Minister, I know you have to go. I know you have to go, and hold on everyone, the Minister has to go. She said it before we started the program. No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. She can, she can just get up and just leave. She wants to do it graciously. No, 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 no. I understand you very seldom have access to someone in higher office. But she's sat here for an hour and a half. And she did say before we started the program, that was our agreement, so she's given us an extra 30 minutes. But Minister, having said that, final word in addressing the anger that is coming out. Final word from you, before, we, before you go. Before you go. Hold on, Papa, hold on, hold on. Minister, final word from you. I, I, I've, just, I've just taken the, the numbers of... You can carry on speaking, we can yeah. hear you. I've taken the numbers of those that have said they need my assistance. Carry on, we can hear you. Because this is what I do. This is what I know that I do. This is what I know that on daily basis when I wake up, I don't wake up for anything else but to serve the people of South Africa. I, that, 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 that I know. And there are, there are thousands, there are thousands of other people who have helped who can also be able to come here and say, we are the beneficiaries. Okay. Just this weekend, this yesterday, <coughs> we were launching the next cohort of 40 top performing enterprises. The previous year, we launched 40. And all of them, that 40, it's a drop in the ocean when you think about what needs to be done. They were given the necessary tools and implements and money. None of those have fallen. Most businesses fall within a period of one year and so forth. All 40 are standing and can show profit. The 40 that we launched yesterday, we also have a plan of ensuring that we follow them. Besides that, it's not about the Department of Small Business Development alone. It is about all government departments ensuring that we work together for a better South Africa. Okay. So today as I am here, the one thing I can tell you, Ridi, is that we've made mistakes. Yes, we accept that we've made mistakes. But if there's one thing I can tell you all sitting here, we don't wake up in the morning to mess up with people of South Africa. We wake up to work. Okay. All right, Minister, that's it. Come, come. Yeah. You, can, you can get up. Thank you very yeah. much for joining us today. For joining, for joining us today. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe I can take someone, your number. Somebody's going to help you. Somebody's going to help you with your microphone. Somebody's going take, to help you with your microphone. Your okay, in the meantime, while somebody's coming to help the minister, you, um, let's go to the gentleman. Thank you. And uh, number one, I wanted the minister to note the following. One, there is a whole range of misinterpretation of stipulation of section 25 on the, of the Constitution of Republic of South Africa. As people are saying that 
There is a willing buyer, a willing seller, which they take it as a law. Meanwhile, it is a principle on its own. Number two, uh, I want the government to take into consideration that they are failing the land reform program by not finalizing the land reform programs, which were registered before 1998. Number three, we want the government to, final, to, final, to finish the change system of the pretext tax government, wherein they are giving more powers to the chiefs, meanwhile the chiefs are not the custodians of land. Yeah. And then they are the, 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 the only the chiefs, meanwhile the landholders are the people themselves who are residing within those areas. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Okay, I must just say at this point that we invited South Africans to tune in. They've sent us messages. They've participated in the program. Let's just hear some of the messages that were left for us by South Africans from all walks of life. Take a listen. Economical transformation can be possible if our government plays a, a leading role by assisting these poor people. There's very same poor people. Poor people is the very same poor people who was running this economy pre-1994. And I think this is the very same people who can assist in getting our economy where it should be. I think radical economic transformation is a good thing, but it depends on how the government implements it. For example, look at our neighboring country, Zimbabwe. Radical economic transformation was implemented in Zimbabwe and it didn't do any good to the economy. Instead, greedy people took advantage of it. So in South Africa, it will really depend on our leaders, how they implement it and the plans they have and the, the how good they will put that Hello, Office today. Um, thank you for your time. All I hear that in that this debate is to why I'm blaming each other. My opinion says, let's stop blaming each other. Let's stop pointing fingers to each other and also help in helping our economical rate to, uh, to change for the better. Let's stop saying Zuma does, by does, all of those leaders that we have this and this and this. Everyone has a responsibility. You I think a radical transformation is the cold word for this because radical economic transformation only benefits the elites, the people that are in government. It doesn't come down to the grassroots level for where people need like transformation the most. The poor people are always suffering. Then government comes up with the rhetorical slogans like uh, be all right. So those are the comments from our audience at home. But Ben, I, I do want to hear, we, we've heard here that land is not only an emotive issue, it is also about identity. It is also about aspirations for a more equitable economy. Can you share from your travels and your research, countries that have been where we are and have done land reform successfully? I'm thinking about Brazil. Sure, Brazil has its own problems, but they've done land reform and it has practically worked. To an extent? Well, there, there are some success stories in Brazil, absolutely, uh, mainly because of su uh, substantial government support. Uh, of course, they have a very large uh, globally competitive agribusiness sector as well, and some critics say that government is actually more supportive of agribusiness than it is of people. But I suppose the, the closest example to us is Zimbabwe, and I think we have some interesting lessons to learn there. I would say my own evaluation is the glass is half full, in other words, it's half empty. I think Zimbabwe shows that small-scale farmers can be highly productive. I think that, that uh, is very evident in the tobacco industry. When I lived in Zimbabwe, small-scale farmers did not produce um, flu-cured tobacco. It was reckoned to be too complicated for them. Now they're producing 99% of flu-cured tobacco. Uh, of course, there are problems as well. Export crops have, have disappeared and the country is desperate for foreign exchange, so it's also uh, half empty. But I think right on our doorstep is an example of a case where the large-scale commercial sector held out against land reform for so many decades. They weren't prepared to come to the party, Theo. They were not prepared to donate land until it was too late. Mm -hmm. There's a real lesson for white farmers here. Come to the party with land as well as offers of, of assistance, and you can make a future as a South African. But the, uh, another side of that story, our farmers in Zimbabwe, although their production levels is very close to where it was before 2000, 
are some of the most exploited human beings on the face of the earth. Because they do not own the land, because there is no access to financing, they are being financed by these big tobacco companies, cotton companies, all the closed value chains, the, the stuff you cannot sell from a street corner. And they are also, their produce are also bought by the same companies. So they keep their noses just above the water. And if they complain too much, they dip them under for a while. That is why you do not see thriving, profitable black farmers in Zimbabwe. But you do see them. But you do see them. No, they are not in, there. in the tobacco industry, you definitely do. You do see them, you yeah, say. Absolutely. The evidence is there. Okay. Hard empirical evidence. Joan, rich, Joan, rich you also. Farmers. They're, getting, they're starting small and they're getting bigger. Okay, Joan. They are still small. Right. Um, they, they're not exploited. Okay, let's give Joan a chance. Now, what Joan, I wanted to share is the big issue around farming, which was raised right at the beginning, was marketing. We've grown this. There's no transport. There's no markets. We're forced to sell to X. Well, we had a similar problem in the Eastern Cape, Kucha, and to assist the dairy farmers, they actually put in a mutual transport system, took all the milk to Kocha, and today the farmer's milk products are being made into cheese, etc., and exported. Now that's from a, a special economic zone to help farmers in Limpopo, Free State, and also in Pomalanga. <coughs> and uh, Northern uh, Cape. How do we spread it all over the country so that it's well, not just this in is the Eastern it. Cape? We've got 17 SEZs, but What's more... What's an SEZ? That's a special economic zone, oh, really. Okay. Special SEZ. economic <laughs> zone. But we also have industrial parks because we realize the special economic zones are actually for larger entities, whereas the industrial parks are for the smaller, the really small growers. And... They create the market through insisting, through public procurement, which is a policy of government, that the government entities, whether it's schools, whether it's municipalities, hospitals, are forced through legislation to buy from these small entities. With respect to the young man here, the youth, and you are our future, I haven't forgotten that, where you said you've applied all over Trade and industry would be one of the places. I don't know where your constituency is. Mine is the inner city of Johannesburg. And I can tell you, when people walk in there on Monday, they fill in a form, the very same day, come there any time, a letter is written by us to seven departments to apply for assistance. How successful are you? What's your success rate? Because the well, letters can be year, written. Well, in a year, now I agree with you, when the government doesn't respond immediately, I go to the commercial and private sector and say, right, do you want an economy that works? Then please look at this uh, application. What is the success rate? I do, in a month, maybe 60 letters, 40 to 60. And yes, it isn't a high success rate, it's 57%. So, Joan, I mean, you are one of the veterans of the ANC. Yeah, she's one of the veterans of the ANC. I mean, do you have hope when you hear the young people? And I know the energy with which we've related this, that you push, you write to these people. But it shows that the system is not working if you have to go to such lengths to get these young people noticed. They should be able to be noticed at the first point of, of, of contact. I would agree with you there. And to that extent, we are now putting eight, the equivalent of ATMs in the various places where you can just key this in yourself. But of course, the young can do that. People of my age and perhaps just below may not be that au fait with these electronic systems, but they've got cell phones. But it is true that we need to make this more and more accessible. Are you hopeful? I am very hopeful, and that is why I want to even come back for another term. I'm 73 on the 30th of November, That's and I am ago. strong. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to come. Tem Temba, we haven't heard from you in a while, and Leon as well. Temba? Yeah, um, I must say that uh, the, the main challenge that we have as a country is not so much that we do not have enough resources. Of course, there's no country that will ever say they have enough money. 
but I believe that if the money that uh, is in the hands of government was used in the right way for the right things, yeah. many, many of our people have been lifted you know, out of poverty. Um, and it is more for the executive because as parliament, you know, with the separation of powers, yes, we can make recommendations, but the, the principle of statehood is say that parliament cannot instruct cabinet what to do. We can only recommend and say, these are the things that are wrong, this is what you must correct, but it's, it's up to them to act. But what we're doing now, we're amending the Public Audit Act to give the Auditor General more powers to be able to enforce um, and to, to take action against accounting officers who misuse or who allow public money to be wasted uh, under their watch, which we believe that might save us money, which can be used to address the needs of our people. Because surely, 23 years down the line, we can't still be debating and be discussing and yet our people are going hungry every day and every night. And one can understand the anger. I mean, last week our conversation was around state capture. You can't separate what we're talking about uh, today from state capture, because state capture means that people are looting resources that should go towards empowering young people such as yourself, creating market access, informal traders, we heard from you. It simply means that money is going down the drain. Look, Reggie, just, mm -hmm. just one last point. If you look at ESCOM, and what is being revealed about how money is looted. And the fact that currently ESCOM can actually bring down this economy because it has <laughs> state guarantees of about 300 billion rands. They have used about 250 billion. And because they got a qualified audit opinion, it is actually breaking one of the conditions for the loan. So if all those companies that they borrowed money from can say, you have breached your, your, condi your conditionality, we want our money back, this country does not have that mm. amount of money. Leon, I, I do want, I mean, you spoke, and I agree with you, I've observed it where informal traders are being, uh, uh, streets are being cleaned up of informal uh, traders as if they are some sort of curse. Uh, but as a free market con uh, foundation, I still want to go back to a theme that we explored earlier. The Competition Commission, every single week we hear that cartels are being investigated, collusion, price fixing, uh, 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 closing off the economy to some players. W what are your thoughts on that? Because it seems as if the private sector can't be trusted to do the right thing. There's a, there's a kind of romance about the Competition Commission as if it does good things. And we've heard about the bread price here. How many people here realize that what the Competition Commission did was force them to raise the price of bread? It said they were charging too little and it was making it uncompetitive for small uh, bakers. The Competition Commission recently made ShopRite pay a fine for giving nine uh, reckless lending transactions. By the time they made that ruling, all nine people, all of whom were black, had paid back their loan in full, proven that they are credit worthy, and then we had the national credit regulator declaring them not to be credit worthy. These people can never get credit again lawfully. It is unlawful to give them credit. So we need to be very clear about what this does. Most typically what the Competition Commission does is it forces prices up, not down. There's a belief that the, the you're rape... You're talking the about the Competition Commission, I hear that, but I'm talking, I want the focus to be more on big business. The yes. businesses that have been found to be colluding, uh, shutting others out, surely that is a problem. We can talk about the weaknesses of the Competition Commission, but uh, big, big business has not clothed itself in glory, it those who've been investigated. It is yeah? a problem, Reedy, and I know that you think somehow the Free Market Foundation should represent them. We don't. We represent informal traders, we represent poor peasant farmers, we represent so people... In shanty towns, this government is perpetuating the 1913 Land Act, Natives Land Act, by not giving black people ownership to their land. Right now, black people live in South Africa under house arrest. The government will give you an RDP house, and if you don't stay there, if you, they don't find you there, they repossess it. In other words, the government tells you where to live for eight years, the so-called preemptive clause. The old apartheid houses prior to 1994 are still not owned by black people. Now, and what they should do is there's something like 10 million, nobody knows exactly, black people who have a piece of land. This government should say all of those people now own that land. Okay. That's it. So it's still, it makes, you know, the ghost of Fervut. 
the, the ghost of Thurwut walks around Latuli House with a big smile on his face and says, if I knew the ANC would implement my land policy and not allow black people to own land, I would have given them power long ago. What a cynic you are. Some of our audience members, some of our audience members think it is Theo who must be giving the land. No, no, nobody should be given land. The people who have the land Release right the now, land, using your no, term. they should be given a piece of paper saying it's yours. The they should be people. say they should be saying, you. This is the end of apartheid land where black people are not allowed to own land. We are still living under apartheid. Temba, what what are you saying no to? No, no, no. You see, you see the the point that is making is that. Africans own land. All they need is just a piece of paper. Then everything is fine. And that's wrong. Okay. We, we had something about the Zamazamas. Let's go. Yeah, I was getting worried that uh, economy. Let's ask the question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really? Mm. I was going to be asking the minister. She's oh, left now. I'm sorry. But I will say it nevertheless that uh, the economy is not only about agriculture. We have got... Uh, uh, small-scale miners in South Africa that are being criminalized by the state uh, against whom the laws of mining and so forth are, are being draconized. And we're saying the list of the minerals that are left in the old mines, in the diamond mines, in Kimberley and so forth, in the gold mines, For let us be allowed to mine uh, in a regulated manner, we have said to government, let us regulate the industry. Mm. So that the minister with the, with the small enterprises, she must know that Zamazamas are also small enterprises. Yeah. They must be regulated and be permitted so that we make money out of this as well. Formalize the sector. Yeah, okay. Let's give a chance. Yeah. Right. Good. I was the side. Good evening. Let's give uh, Mama a chance. Um, let's give Mama a chance. She's, let's give Mama a chance here. I saw your hand earlier in the first hour. Carry on, Ma. Um, uh, my question is towards Theo. Theo, uh, I'm a crop farmer out at Colini. Um, we have a challenge as farmers. And um, I was just too glad to see you as a president for Farmers Association, World Farmers Association. We have a problem with the suffix prices. We don't even break even. You know very well, for me to work on a hectare, I've got to have plus minus 8,000 of maize. And because of the drought, I've never broken even. So what are you guys doing about the suffix prices? Thank you. Theo, do you want to answer that? No, you've got the mic on. We complain exactly the same way you complain about it. <laughs> It is, the, the, the challenge is that as a farmer, I'm always a price taker. When, when we buy our seed, when we buy our fertilizer or tractor, I cannot negotiate the price down. I pay retail price, but when I sell my produce, I cannot say this is what I want for it. I must take what I get. And every year that gap closes up to the point where, for example, in wheat, it is nearly impossible to make a profit these days, especially because more efficient farming mechanisms and subsidized countries can get the wheat on our markets for much cheaper than what we can produce it. Chicken is very much in the same situation. So w what we actually need is for government to make a policy to say that we need this much chicken or this much wheat to be produced in South Africa and protect that part of the market. And there's nothing wrong with giving preference in that protection for new entrants, smallholder farmers, okay. farmers who recently got their land, and especially to then subsidize those farmers to, to become profitable. That's another topic altogether, subsidizing. Thank you very much, Theo. You had a, a comment or a question? Yeah, I've got a, a comment. Mm. Uh, and quest Can a little bit question. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, We've got two minutes. Okay. Uh, Bagwetu, si songe si la, angisho mshambe no mange si zul no mange swas. Angazuti kwa wamendi kuluma no baani, maiti kuluma nati. Tine singa na wano mshambe so ne mizi etasi own, asina yewe land ownership. Magu kulunyo ange timokras, tine sasa nzai window shopping, sasa singa yako gule yon to leon. 
got about yes biza manji kawa mediti funu kuluma i kuluma no bad i release the umshaba uzegiti land ownership i'm from Komas local municipality we are, we are next to swaziland and mozambique if i can tell you uguti abantu basa swazin banigezwa bane access yoktola umshaba in south africa it's just because the chief the, most of the chiefs are from swaziland but ba, basebenzela in south africa Bahola in Malaysia, South Africa. Balanda bantu basa Swaziland and Mozambique. Bahola i pension, batola ma services South Africa. Tina aswatoli. Umsebenzo skuluma ngaumanje magutu kusisa wenza umsebenzo go agriculture na na what what. Asina we i right yok tola even ama water right. Uza 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 usebenzo kanja nwa msa bunga na water right. Unga na yo ne land ownership. So as as nele segna logon. Thank you. Okay. So. Again, just, just emphasizing the same problems, that uh, he doesn't know what the government is referring to when it says that it consults people because they don't see the government, they don't uh, hear from them, the government doesn't listen to the people. Land ownership is a major issue, water rights uh, are a major issue. So these are systemic problems. Apart from the land ownership, there are other layers that are just complicated and continue to exclude uh, people such as the gentleman. Yeah, I would agree, and uh, I think, um, look, <coughs> we're focusing a lot on land and agriculture and small uh, and informal traders, <coughs> but I think we have to talk, talk about the structure of the economy as a whole. Yes. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's the 40% the unemployment is the single biggest problem facing us. And no matter how many small-scale traders we support, it's not going to do away with that mm. problem. We have to get large investment, massive investment in creating new jobs. Constant. And I would say that in addition to land and agriculture, we need to think about industry, manufacturing mm -hmm. industry. And I was very pleased that uh, Mr. Ramaphosa made industrial policy a key plank in the New Deal that he was talking Constance, about. Constance, I'll give you the last word very quickly. Yeah. I think we need to correct governance in South Africa because it is not about lack of budget and lack of money. It is about managing that money because the national development plan that the minister was talking about, uh, it is confirmed that 50% of the budget that is being used for land reform went to consultant and that budget could have bought 50% of the land that we are crying about. Thank you. So then, thank you for watching the second hour of the big debate. So many unresolved issues that will bring our economy to its knees unless we work together. We've been talking about radical economic transformation and we've heard that thousands of young people are desperate to set up businesses and to become productive in the economy. Government says they are ready to help. We certainly want to hear from some of the people that the minister mentioned, those whom they have helped, whom she says have been a success. Let's hope that from this moment, for Forward, the two can actually come together. Meanwhile, don't miss our new episodes of The Big Debate. In February, we'll be talking about women's rights, the nuclear deal, and freedom in Zimbabwe. Your Saturday nights will never be the same. Please be safe during the festive season. Thank you very much for joining us on The Big Debate. We look forward to spending time with you next year. Goodbye.